Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. On today's episode, I'm going to be interviewing one of my favorite guitarists, and I think probably the most important improvising guitarist of the past generation, Kurt Rosenwinkel. I can't think of a guitarist, and, and I don't mean jazz guitarist, rock guitarist, progressive rock guitarist, progressive metal guitarist that aren't influenced by Kurt. To say that Kurt is a jazz musician honestly does a disservice to his music. He is an improviser and a composer. He won a National Endowment Composers Award in 1995. He signed his first record deal in 1996 with Verve Records. He's been putting out records since then. He's played with everyone you can think of. He has a record that's co-produced with Q-Tip called Hardcore. He has his own record label that he's been putting out records for the last five years or so. We're going to be talking about that in the interview, but let me play you some of Kurt's music so you can get a feel for him. And turn him into Many videos of Kurt playing on YouTube just like that one. Definitely check them out. Search through them. I'm going to have some other examples of Kurt playing within the interview uh, from his master class. Here's my interview with Kurt. How you doing? I'm doing good, Rick. How you doing, man? Good. Good to see you. I bought your master class, your Harmony one. I noticed. <laughs> I bought it today. I was like, okay, I, get I need to look. I want to watch this. Before I talked to him, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing. But you're, when you put it on Instagram and your, um, your ad that you did last week where you're playing over like A, Aeoli and A minor flat six. just back that up for a second check out his feel and how beautiful that last phrase was It's you're smoking on it, and then you did the melodic minor. Thanks. It's 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 been it's been such a wild time this year, and you know as soon as it went to lockdown, we were like, okay, uh, let's switch up here. You know, then somebody asked me to do a a a streaming thing, and I got my iPhone out, and it was upside down and backwards and all messed up and everything, and the audio was all screwed up. So I was like, okay, we got to get real good real fast here, you know. And um, so me and my fiance Sky, we just uh, we bought a camera, and I couldn't even figure out how to plug it into the computer. You know, it's like, how does this work? You know, and it's like <laughs> such a mystery. <laughs> we went through that whole uh, learning curve and and all of that, and it was it was a trip, man. But you know, we figured it out, and then we started. You did. Getting 
creative with it and it's just been uh kind of wild to just explore this whole other side of creativity with the visuals and you know just some storylines and just messing around and having some fun in addition to um having that support uh some real serious work with the master classes which are have been um really good to just dive into uh that whole world you know and there's there's so much inside um of me that i that i can bring out you know for just perspective on music and stuff like that so it's it's been great to to do those classes. you find it cathartic when you're writing you know when you're doing one of these and you start writing stuff down and then next thing you know you've got an entire book of of i you know of all this <laughs> stuff that you know yeah, absolutely. It's it's wonderful. You know, I started writing the book for for this last class and I just I sat down and with a pen and with large I like to use large music paper, um, you know, big book and uh I just started writing in, in pen and and I wrote like thirty pages uh just, you know, all through and didn't really make any mistakes you know it's kind of wild you know it's just it's all there and it's also a uh, very cool way to be in touch with people in this time you know because I do like a two-hour presentation but before that everybody's on their mics and we're just saying hello and just laughing you know and saying hi and just hanging out and it's really that's cathartic too you know just sharing a space with with your fans and and people who are or just want like this moment to just say hi and and have a communion with people it's been really great well you have such a dry sense of humor too that's the thing that's that uh i don't know if people realize that about you but if you want if you look at your instagram and anybody that doesn't follow kurt on instagram follow him there and but you really do, and you you put that into your into your videos as well. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of fun, man. We just <laughs> just mess around, man. Just just have some fun, and it's cool because you can you can do like little vignettes, you know, and and just you know just be silly and and just have a laugh, man. Because you know I don't you know I'm not too precious about uh, being the artist, you know, or whatever, you know, we can just have fun, have a laugh, celebrate life and have a good time. And then when we get down to the work, that's serious work, you know. Let me ask you this. Do you think of yourself as a jazz musician or just an improviser? Uh, I think of myself as a composer and as a jazz musician, as a modern music uh, maker. My my roots are in a lot of things because I grew up with rock and with hip hop and with soul and with jazz and with hard rock and like ACDC and the Beatles and pop. I love uh, so many different kinds of music and it's really just in my bones, you know. Bowie is one of my heroes, you know, Biggie Smalls is one of my heroes and Charlie Parker and Bud Powell, you know, so they all... Uh, exist on the same uh, um, heroic plane for me as far as like touchstones for music and Joe Henderson and and uh, Duke Ellington and, and, and Brahms and there's just so much depth and connection at the source where all these traditions meet you know so I tend to not think of myself as a as a jazz musician per se but as just a modern uh, music musician, you know, modern music uh, maker, you know. I saw videos of you a long time ago playing with like a, a hog, I think it is, where you yeah. would hold a chord with it and then solo over it. I mm -hmm. never could figure out how to do that. Uh, <laughs> I was like, how does he do that? And I love that you use, you know, pedals and things like that and you're you're totally into to experimenting with sounds and uh but to me that your sound when you're playing with your non-transient sound is so great for your lines does it feel like you're not playing a guitar that you're playing almost a wind instrument or something or that yeah it does i'm free from the the limitations of 
of the pick and having to always have that kind of very sharp articulation that you get when you pluck a string with a pick. I love to be able to determine the articulation of my phrases depending on you know how how I hear it rather than kind of fighting with the instrument to to get the right kind of um, sustain and then articulation because I don't want to play very hard so that I can you know my left hand has always been really strong so I can play without a pick without even picking the notes I can just play with my left hand and that'll be pretty almost there so I just use my right hand to to complete the articulation of the phrases and the syncopation of the lines I don't necessarily want a sharp attack but when I do want one I can get one so there that makes me feel uh, liberated from the the, the the transient nature of, of the guitar so your time feel is so good when you're playing that you can pretty much play anything and it sounds good because your sense of phrase you have such a good way that you put phrases together that yes you can play over any set of changes but you also can play go anywhere because of your time feel and that is incredibly that that's a real big part of your style to me man <laughs> dude you the man you the man rick well that's that's i mean that's pretty much it if you have great if you have great feel you can pretty much play any notes yeah right you know right i mean that that thing that you put out with the uh with the e mixolydian that was like I mean, that's like exactly what you're talking about. Just perfect, like articulation and beautiful phrasing. And, you know, man, you're you're such a great player. I didn't pay you to say that, or <laughs> just, just so uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. You have a background playing bebop, but you're, but you don't play like a bebop player. You play really angular lines and super melodic. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. It's, it's, you know, I, I really enjoyed making these little vignettes for for the for the last master class because uh you know like i i talk a lot about um the chords that we find in all the how cool they are and how we can make uh such a lot of music with them so i made these vamps for each of the uh of the modes of this of the four scales not all of them but like 18 or 20 uh, different vamps that you can play along with and it's so cool because you know you can just dive into the sound of the harmony but with a uh, varying lot of different uh, musical feels that are in these vamps that I created that are so fun to play over it's just you know you can just jam on it all day long these master classes that you've done are you thinking about music in a different way or the things that you just kind of naturally do when you when you have to actually explain them it's a different things that you've been doing forever mm. and but then you have to say okay how do you explain this to somebody i've been a teacher and i was a i was a professor in berlin uh for 10 years and uh and then four before that so i have a lot of experience teaching so a lot of the stuff with the guitar was just like, I just started writing and it came out um, no problem. But the thing that was really challenging for me was to talk about composition and songwriting, because that's something that has always remained completely uh, natural in, in my life. Uh, it's just always something that just kind of happens. And, and there's, and then, and then I've developed a lot of processes and meth methods along the way for uh, working with with uh, songwriting and composing but the essential elements of of how a song comes into manifestation is something that's really 
uh, mystical and deep and esoteric, actually, and but very specific. And so it was a, a real trip to start preparing for, for that masterclass and and really dig deep to to take a look at exactly what's going on in uh, w when a song is being born and what is my role uh, in that birth, in that manifestation. And sometimes it's being a channel for something that's coming through uh, already and you have to help it along in certain different ways. It's almost like being a midwife. Sometimes songs are just kind of out there and then you have to reach out and grab them and and so it's kind of like fishing and that's a whole other relationship so uh, in the master class i did about composition i talk about all these different kinds of uh, ways and approaches and, and phenomenon really uh about how songs come into being and that one was, was really deep for me to to get into to really figure out what is going on in in the songwriting phenomenon why is it that some people don't like jazz music why do you think that is <laughs> oh man i don't know i don't know maybe they just don't know how to give it a chance uh and how to to actually just listen without expectations or or demands, you know, from from what we're what we're listening to, you know, if you can just listen to the music and and be uh, just have an open mind um, and give it the space that it needs, because you know it's not instant gratification in a lot of times, but you know, I, th I think that, uh, you know, it's it's complex, but it's not that complex. It's just it's just complexity that that is built built upon a strong foundation that that goes towards creating a, a whole that in the best examples is just as uh, approachable as any pop song, you know, in my opinion, you know, so I think some some of it you just have to uh listen a little bit more and maybe you know people uh might hear something complicated and that's their impression of it and they just kind of don't want to engage with it because it's there's too much going on you know i mean that's why in my music i try to give you know something that's very easy for someone to to get swept up in so that they don't have to think so much for people that don't know your music where do you think they should start what's a good record to start with um i think kaipi is a good place to start it's um you know there's 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 a lot of different kinds of sort of genres within my musical universe and my cosmos you know and uh kaipi is is one of them and star of jupiter is another and um and then you know uh um one of my albums called reflections is a ballad sort of a ballad uh, standards record that's trio people seem to like that one because it's quite uh it's quite intimate it's nice guitar. yeah very stripped down yeah i'm always working on on new music you know so there's a lot in the works as well that uh hopefully will be out uh pretty soon in the in in this year working on a a bunch of new things that uh, are coming out. I think Kaipi is is good. That that was a, a labor of of love and and something that was very unexpected for me because I I just kind of let things happen and see what they are later and let them define themselves. And all of a sudden, I had this album that was that was uh, very different from the other music that I make. And um, but it was very 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 close to my heart and a band great band formed around that album and we're like family now and and pedro martins is uh was was part of that Excellent. and still really close to the the hardcore family and 
and he's he put out an album on hardcore called Vox, which is a wonderful, beautiful album. He's making his second album right now for hardcore, and we also are just about to release an amazing record by uh, an artist named Daniel Santiago, who was also playing at Crossroads um, with Pedro uh, mm -hmm. 2019. I produced it. Clapton is playing on it. Josh Redman is playing on it. Uh, Aaron Parks is playing on it. And Pedro and I were really excited about that album, too. Cool. That's, that's, so we've been working on that for the past year as well. Okay, let me ask you some of your favorite guitar records, you know, things that were big influential records to you. Kevin Eubanks, Opening mm -hmm. Night, one of my favorites. That album just is one of the most incredible albums for and also for guitar playing. What an amazing record that is. Alan Holdsworth, Metal Fatigue. Gotta have that in there. When I met Alan... <laughs> I said, I said, oh my God, Alan Holdsworth, Metal Fatigue is one of my favorite records of all time. Oh, no. And he just was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> at the airport. <laughs> he was like, oh, and just shook his head and he goes, I've made a lot of records since then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. No, I didn't mean <laughs> I didn't mean to diss every other record since, <laughs> but uh, that that album is one of my uh, Desert Island albums, though. Incredible. Um, that's a must-have. I'd say Schofield, Still Warm. Great record. What a great record. I was recently listening to that in in Omar Hakim's car in his uh, in his uh, Tesla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, uh, he was um, reflecting on those sessions and uh, what what an amazing album that is. I remember hearing uh, Schofield live during during those years, man. That was just, oh, man. Just mind-blowing stuff. Also, I would say um, Pat Metheny Travels is also... Love that record. Big Touchstone beautiful album a live album uh du live double album yeah live double album that's the, right yeah he's got so many incredible solos on that to me that's that's probably his best playing his uh song for bill bill bow that solo on that his guitar synth solo on that is absolutely phenomenal his melodic development on that is yep. uh is is unbelievable there's a lot of i mean i think that's that's one of his best if not his best um one of his best records, playing wise, incredible. Well, okay, what about Wes? Wes, <laughs> you listen to some Wes records, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not a I'm not a huge Wes fan, but I love Wes. I mean, I love uh, uh, his version of Round Midnight on the uh, oh on the baritone guitar. Yeah, yo, that is unbelievable, man. That that really hit me hard that that really inspired me very much you know and smoking at the half note and uh i dig it but i'm not so like magnetized to to wes's playing you know um although i have you know the utmost like reverence and it's just something I, it's just not where i gravitate to as far as uh as far as that so yeah, I'm not the 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 hugest West fan, as you know. Everybody would say I should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about some piano player. You don't mind me asking about these uh, things. I want to ask. What about Keith Jarrett? Let's talk about Keith Jarrett for a second. Keith Jarrett, man, dude. Ah, oh, can't can't with Keith Jarrett man he's just the best the good uh, just so rapturous beauty uh, and terror on 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 the lines man I, I love Keith Jarrett uh still live um one of the greatest albums ever um the standards volume one and two wonderful incredible I love his uh, his American Quartet albums. He made so many in the 70s, and the European Quartet albums, uh, 
all of those are are really great mysteries oh, beautiful such incredible writing and playing you know dewey redmond and charlie hayden and paul motion yeah you know what a band to me that that was really important uh in in my music you know for for some of the some of the things that they were doing and how they were approaching rubato playing uh where everybody was was in the song and it was going along at a certain pace but it was not uh metronomic or it didn't have any subdivisions in it at all you know so there wasn't this quantized thing it was just just moving through the song together uh and the way that they were able to do that uh, with such passion and fire uh, was was you know really important touchstone for me. The European quartet as well. It's just a beautiful, beautiful uh, context to hear Keith because he would just really stretch on on those tunes. It's funny you talk of um, mentioning Charlie Hayden. Charlie Hayden. It, going back to the Ornette records he played on, anytime you know that you'd, they talk about playing free. When Charlie Hayden is playing behind anything, it's not really free. He always puts everything into a harmonic context. Right, right, right. It's really amazing. He had such a good ear. He would harmonize whatever mm -hmm. anyone when if Dewey was playing, if Ornette was playing, it doesn't matter. And on any of these records that Charlie played on his ear was so good that nothing was ever free, really. Right. He was just like this big home for everyone to live in. Anything that you want people to know about you, Kurt, that they don't. <laughs> I'm Scorpio. <laughs> I like walks in the park. Actually, no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Kurt, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. This is way, way overdue. We've been talking about doing this for a couple of years now. This is great. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. And we'll, uh, you know, next time that we hang, we'll do we'll do it in person. So it'll be great. Yeah, man. Thank uh, you so much. All right, Kurt. Rick. I want to once again thank Kurt for being my guest today. This was really a fun interview to do. And I encourage you to go to Kurt's website and check out all the music he's putting out on his label. In addition, go to Spotify, go to Apple Music and listen to Kurt's music. It is absolutely fantastic. I only was able to play a few snippets here and there, but he is just, you know, he's, he's one of my favorite all-time musicians. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.